innovative solution. So thank you. I'd now like to invite all three presenters, Abe, Samia, and Anjan, just to give you a few minutes to sort of speak to each other. Uh, you both covered three very salient issues. And as we all know, these issues don't stand on their own. They are always intersection with each other. So uh, how about we get started with Anjan. We've got to hear from Samia and Abe. Any comments on how uh, this is showing up for uh, in terms of gender? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm hoping folks at home can hear. I'm, I'm speaking quite loudly into my phone, so uh, I do apologize if it's not as loud as it can be. I will say I think it goes back to this question of care. I think uh, whether it's addressing homelessness, that is a form of care. Uh, many of the professions and occupations that racialized workers are overrepresented in are care-based. And so I think what is going to get us out of this crisis, and we're already seeing this, we need to make sure that this is what we're investing in after this crisis ends. We know that this crisis is not going to end next week, next month, and we don't know for how many months it'll go. But I think historically we've seen an underinvestment in things like child care, in the health care system, in long-term care. Uh, many of the places that women and gender diverse people work. Um, and I think what, one of the things I just want to highlight is that care looks different and there's so many different levels. Uh, one piece I didn't talk a lot about is structural care. So we know uh, this week the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was available for people to apply. Uh, and what, one of the things that has been a concern for us historically in uh, the social safety net is it is quite robust compared to other countries, such as the U.S., if we look at our neighbor to the south. But there are still a lot of gaps. There are a lot of equity-seeking communities who are left out. And we see this quite clearly with employment insurance. So employment insurance is something uh, many uh, people pay into. But women in particular, especially women who are overrepresented in precarious work and short-term work, often have a very, very difficult time actually accessing that benefit because one of the requirements is the number of hours that you work. And so if women are more likely to be working in short-term work or precarious work or temporary work, they can't actually access that entitlement that they've already paid into. And so this is why we, we saw some benefits with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, because this is one of the challenges. EI doesn't work for everyone. But I think what, what this moment is highlighting is that we have to start to look at all of these interventions that we're doing in the moment and ensure that there's an intersectional lens so we're never in this position again. I think, um, you know, one of the key things is this crisis is weakening inequity. So we really have to start to not just think about how do we get back to normal, but how do we get back to better. Um, and I think uh, whether it's specific services like uh, supporting people experiencing homelessness or supporting diverse equity-seeking communities uh, such as uh, racialized communities, the fact of the matter is we were actually in a crisis before this pandemic, and so we really need to do better as a society. And in my humble opinion, I think care is one of the things we need to deepen our investment in. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Anjan. Not going back to the same, but going back to better. I love that. Uh, Samia, what about you? What, what intersections are you seeing? Um, so just to pick up on what Anjan is saying and uh, what Abe has mentioned um, around the opportunity that exists right now, um, that we see all these policies that are um, uh, kind of expanding our um, social safety net, net, whether it's the basic, the idea of basic income coming back or uh, providing um, appropriate housing to those who need it, um, putting a health and eviction, um, things that we know uh, were possible all along. Uh, are coming to the forefront and happening really fast. So what this makes me think of, um, first of all, is that uh, there's re a real opportunity right now as policies are coming out to respond to this pandemic to put to pass these policies through an equity filter. 
Um, and uh, as opposed to um, and policies being announced and then uh, communities mobilizing and talking about the gaps and then, um, you know, the time that it takes between uh, the, when the policies come into light first to, for it to actually address the gaps in terms of the vulnerable and marginalized populations that actually need it the most. Um, I'm also then thinking about um, this idea of uh, why we, we, we are uh, we, we've spent all this time talking about racialization and equity and and you know doing all this groundwork over the past few years, um, even thinking about you know truth and reconciliation recommendations and all those things. Uh, that how uh, as a, as a society once we are once we are in a crisis mode and responding. Uh, all of those things are um, no longer a priority. They are being deprioritized. So how do we continue centering this conversation is very important. And more than a conversation, um, how do we make sure that we're legislating uh, equity? Um, what also I, I think about is specifically around the housing conversation, around the halting of um, eviction, or the comments that were made of around rent strike, so people who cannot afford their rent then don't pay it. Um, so I'm thinking about both Andrew and Abe's point of view. So if, if we're talking about people who already have um, power differential between uh, somebody who rents and their landlord, um, especially if there's also a gendered um, power differential, if uh, somebody lives alone, a woman lives alone, a single mother with her children, um, how is it, how it, does a rent strike work? How does just simply saying I'm not going to pay my rent because I can't afford it work? And all of the safety pieces that come up with that um, Andrew was highlighting that the number of uh, domestic violence cases that we're already seeing in other countries and are bubbling under the surface right now in 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 across Canada, uh, and and how do we then create spaces for for people who uh, are or we're already very vulnerable to now seek out the supports that they need. Uh, we're talking about, we talked about the policing um, issue and when we have a legislation that is uh, a warning at best and um, a jail time at worst, um, and that is up to the discretion of the police officer, um, I cannot help but know that racial uh, communities will be disproportionately impacted unless that is uh, put into the legislation unless that there is clear oversight of how uh, these new acts are going to be implemented. Um, so the, that's kind of where I wanted to uh, leave it for now. Great. Thanks, Samia. And then just thinking back to some of the responses we got in the registration for today's conversation, I know one of the comments made by a participant was just the fact that these, uh, these powers through public health and through other um, legal instruments are being rolled out so quickly with very limited or in many cases with really no accountability, uh, with no training for uh, for those who are going to be enforcing them. So yeah, I think you're really making some good points there in terms of that oversight and accountability. Thank you. Abe, what connections are you seeing? You started weaving those in as you shared your, yeah, in your open remarks. I just wanted actually to pick up on the point by Samia around um, the the uh, vulnerabilities with relationships with landlords and uh, one of the things that I think it's important to to think about as we come out of this is that while well, landlords uh, there have been uh, you know legislation related to uh, non eviction of tenants uh, that doesn't mean that landlords aren't currently tracking uh, what's happening with their tenants and as soon as that legislation is lifted, we'll be taking um, uh, kind of a bit of a vengeance, I guess, against uh, folks who who haven't been paying or or who whatever uh, issue they have with the tenant. So I think it's going to be really important that we have uh, proactively think about adequate housing support resources. So, for example, I know our community legal services. Uh, they are already on a, a normal day. They're stretched uh, to support tenants uh, who are going through through various issues with their landlords, uh, legal or uh, personal. And so I think it's going to be really important that we uh, ahead of time provide resources to tenants for things like, okay, if you uh, 
if you have not been paying your rent uh, over this time, um, what what do you do next? What happens next? Uh, and who can help you? And, and making sure that we have enough folks available to help uh, because uh, absolutely this will disproportionately affect uh, racialized communities, uh, single mothers, uh, and uh, indigenous people. Uh, back to uh, the issue around gender, um, I do have some concerns around how women who are leaving violence are being um, uh, uh, managed through the system right now. And uh, unfortunately, the, we are hearing more uh, cases where women are, are being told actually not to uh, come to shelter and uh, to try to, I don't know, somehow work things out with their abuser. Uh, which I, is, of course, deeply, deeply problematic. And it, it's it's disappointing to see best practices that have been laid out over generations uh, suddenly being pushed to the side um, because it's like, oh, well, you know, don't come to shelter. It's already too crowded to be safe. And to me, it's like, okay, well, why why can't folks be streamed directly into the hotels then? So I do think, you know, the lack of preparation, the lack of of pandemic planning for this degree of, of a pandemic is is really showing itself. Uh, again, this isn't the lessons we learned from H1N1. This is a, a whole different situation. So uh, I do hope that that uh, that, that uh, housing and homeless services are continuing to uh, do best practices around safety planning, uh, and that uh, um, um, you can you can practice both safety related to violence and safety related to uh, Great, thank you, Aben. Uh, I would agree with you. What you're describing as best practices being pushed aside are definitely very troubling. I'd like to thank all three of you for just sharing your thoughts with us. and. I'd like us to have some time to respond to some questions from participants. And there's lots of great resources being shared in the chat box, which we'll make available after today's uh, webinar. I'm just going to start in an engine. This is a question for you. Uh, the question is, in all probability, women will lose ground post-COVID-19. How do we mobilize to ensure that this does not happen? And I know at the YWC at Canada, you're already thinking about how we mobilize. So some thoughts there? Uh, one of the things that we've been uh, working very closely with the Prime Minister's office and other key ministers is to ensure that in all of their federal responses to COVID, they are putting a gendered blend. Uh, and so we've been working very hard around some of the immediate crisis situations. So uh, we've been pushing for money for uh, domestic violence shelters and sexual assault centers because we've flagged along with many organizations that violence will increase during this crisis. And so we were... Uh, glad to see that, uh, that the investment was being made. But I think one of the things we have to be really mindful of, and this goes back to the conversation around care, is that women are, and gender diverse folks are on the front lines of this crisis, but they're being underinvested in. And so we have to think back to, uh, you know, health is political, who has access to power, resources, opportunities is political. So one of the things we have to do in this moment is to, uh, is to make sure that uh, that that lens is not lost. Uh, the the promising piece is is that the federal government has started already in many of their other processes before the crisis. Uh, they had an intersectional gender-based analysis that was mainstreaming gender and equity considerations in many different public policies. But we just want to make sure that during a crisis, that all of that hard work and labor that was put forward to ensure that uh, gender and equity analysis is not lost. Uh, so I think what we have to do is mobilize. We have to ensure that we are talking to our members of parliament, um, like other colleagues on the panel have talked about. Uh, but I think this moment is really uh, demonstrating the power of advocacy. You know, I've been talking to a number of public policy advocates who have said that the amount of changes we've seen in public policy in the last 20 days has surpassed the changes that many have, people have seen in the last 20 years. And so I think, uh, you know, going back to Samia's point, we want to make sure that it's not just on communities to highlight the gaps and then government changes. Uh, but 
it is showing the, uh, the power that uh, the moment um, that we're in where there's a lot of power in advocacy and we're actually seeing that happen in real time. So I think I really want to encourage people, if you aren't already part of a group that's advocating for change, this is the moment uh, because we're seeing changes happen in the last 20 days that we haven't seen in the last 20 years. So we can really start to use this opportunity and uh, springboard into the society that we do want. So the next time a crisis happens, because, for example, uh, organizers have been talking a lot about climate change, um, we are going to reach uh, moments in our, in our uh, society's trajectory where we'll, where we'll be confronted with crisis. We want to make sure that we have every resource at our disposal to address that head on. And I think one of the ways to do that is to invest in care. Hey, thank you so much, Anjan. Uh, so we have another question, and Sam and Willa, you get started with this one. And it's around our data. You spoke in your piece around a lack of race-based data, which is, as I know, an ongoing concern in terms of health data in this country. Uh, the question is, how can we organize to get that finally done? Some thoughts there? Yeah, so um, I think that what there is um, some uh, resources that were shared in the chat box around, um, as you've mentioned, like, for example, there was a, a race-based data symposium uh, maybe a month uh, or, or, or um, maybe a month before um, COVID had hit us. Um, so the conversation has started, but my concern has been up to this point, and I agree with Anjum, there is a, a really golden opportunity for us to push things forward, is that um, with this crisis, a lot of things that were uh, already uh, in, in, in the, uh, that were already starting to move along have been halted. So the challenge is how do we make sure that the conversation continues? And I think the numbers that are coming to us right now from the U.S. Um, can you, sorry, can you hear me? So the numbers yes, are coming, yeah, perfect. So the numbers that are coming to us from the U.S. Um, can be used as a, a good example of what we're trying to avoid in this country and how are we trying to manage. Uh, the crisis in a way that racialized people are not disproportionately impacted. And um, the reason why this is actually also critical right now is as we are um, experiencing or, um, or will be experiencing shortage of um, both personal protective equipment and ventilators and life-saving equipment, uh, there is a lot of conversation that is happening right now in terms of uh, what are the ethical choices that um, frontline workers and physicians have to make in terms of who gets um, the ventilators and who gets uh, life-saving, um, you know, uh, procedures uh, when things uh, and if things reach that uh, level. So it's important for us to have these conversations right now and ensure that there's an equity and racialized um, filters um, before we get to that. Excellent. Thanks for that. And uh, in the chat box, um, participant is saying we all need to be activists, include the need for collection of race-based data in the activities and conversations, and I cannot agree more. Uh, I think this has been, it's been a challenge in the Canadian healthcare system. It remains one, and there is some work happening, and the more of us who can add our, our voice to that conversation, I think this is the, this is the moment to finally get it done. Uh, Abe, the next question is for you. Uh, so, we're seeing this really innovative uh, approaches coming in terms of housing. So what is the discussion of yeah, what that, happens that's a, after that's the pandemic? That's a great question and, and of course, a big motels. concern. I mean, the and last thing we there, want um, to see is, is everything just right kind now. of reset back to, uh, Related to this work. back to the rather miserable situation we were in before this started. Um, I know uh, in, in several communities, uh, folks have tried to have that ask. Uh, primarily, we're getting kind of pushback that it's it feels too early for the the municipal policymakers and and even provincial level uh, to to think that far ahead as they're still in crisis mode. Uh, but what we are doing on the research side, uh, my team uh, in particular, we're doing a couple rap rapid reviews uh, around practices. Uh, as a, a nursing school, we're looking at practices being put in place to protect long-term care uh, homes. 
uh, my own work on homelessness were trying to to collate all of the different municipal actions around homelessness um, and and as much as possible though our data sources are limited to track the outcomes of, of some of those actions so at least what we'll have at the end of this is we'll have a pretty good database of, of everything that's been done um, as a starting point to argue about what should continue to be done. What I'd invite everyone on the line is that uh, research communities are actually in a strange space right now where most of our work got halted um, and most of our ability to, to do work is, is highly limited. Uh, so I'd invite you is, is reach out to your local researchers, reach out to, to your local uh, universities. If you have folks doing research in, in equity, in determinants of health, uh, if you have ideas of information that you want to be tracked during this crisis that can be used later on, uh, reach out and make that ask. Because uh, in a strange way, we are kind of looking for things, especially as we try to pivot all of our masters and PhD students to work that they can actually do at this time. So uh, that's a little bit of data that we're collecting, but uh, anything that you have, uh, do re reach out to academics to help you collect that, that information. Great, thank you so much, Abe. So we're going to take one last question, and then I'm going to invite all three speakers to provide us with some uh, some closing remarks. Uh, so this is a question uh, about really the intersections we're seeing around gender, employment, and education. Uh, so participant is citing a recent report talking about the fact that Black women specifically have the, one of the highest rates and are also highly educated, particularly people with PhDs. So is there any anyone aware of some work going on? Like, how do we raise that issue and keep it on the agenda now uh, and uh, post-pandemic? I think, Anjan, in your, in your piece, you spoke to the kinds of jobs women are doing. Uh, you talked about the C's, right? And so this uh, participant's introducing another thing here, where we're seeing highly educated black women with high rates of unemployment. Any thoughts there? And Anjan, Samir, I'll let either of you go first. Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, before this crisis, we saw that actually the economy is slowing in its growth. And so this whole notion of increased profits and increasing, uh, uh, increasing profits fueling the rest of society was becoming less and less likely. And so it really speaks the notion that we need all hands on deck. We need every single person to be able to uh, achieve their full potential and have access to the jobs that are commensurate with their skills. Uh, this is a slightly uh, of a tangent, but it, it speaks also to the gap we're just seeing in society where we're not utilizing all people's skill set. So we know in Ontario, that there's 13,000 foreign uh, or internationally trained physicians. And during this crisis, one of the uh, policy options that has been put forward is how do we actually uh, allow the people who have incredible skills to join the fight against COVID? And we've seen some changes being considered in British Columbia, some changes being considered in Ontario, uh, some uh, internationally trained physicians are uh, having the opportunity to apply for a 30-day medical license. And so we're seeing that in this crisis, people are saying, wow, there's people with incredible skill sets that we have not leveraged. Let's do that. Uh, one of the critiques to that is that is it only in times of crisis that we want to engage with communities, uh, uh, equity-seeking communities, to ensure that they can uh, access their full potential? Or is it something that we should be doing and having the foundation for throughout uh, during, uh, you know, quote unquote, normal times? So I think it also goes back to the question of racialized women, black women, indigenous women, uh, women with disabilities. There's so many groups that have been uh, left behind and have not been leveraged and have not been able to achieve their full potential. So I think the moment is now. Um, also, we know that this pandemic will have multiple uh, 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 peaks and uh, multiple, um, it's going to be something that's going to be with us for a number of months. So I think right now the economy that we're going to see after 18 months of this crisis is going to look very different. 
the, uh, the occupations and the jobs and the industries and sectors that were before this crisis will look very different. So I think this is a moment where we can actually create pathways to those new jobs. Uh, at YWCA Canada, we've been doing a lot of work in ensuring that women are not left behind in jobs in artificial intelligence and coding and some of the new sectors that we're starting to see. So I think that's one of the things we have to think about. There's a lot of people who are not working or who will need to be reskilled. Let's ensure that that reskilling has an equity lens. Yeah, just to add to what Anjum just said, um, and particularly we know that um, racialized women are usually not the ones in decision-making um, positions. So I'm just going to reflect quickly on a, a, a post I saw the other day that said um, the future is female, and it, it, um, it was highlighting the number of medical officers of health in this country uh, that are leading the, the fight against COVID. And um, it was wonderful to see um, uh, you know, all the women who are taking the lead. However, um, of course, there was not a single black woman amongst those women who are uh, taking charge of this. And this is a reflection of this question of uh, around uh, having highly skilled and educated black women in this country, yet we are not represented um, in, in, in these um, positions. And it gets back to the conversation that we had in this country around when our, um, you know, federal government, um, you know, we had a gender parity cabin. However, we did not have a single black person at that time. And, and even we never had a single black woman uh, up to date. So, so the conversation has to be centered. And when we talk about gender parity and gender equity and, uh, you know, representation of women um, in positions of power, we often tend to forget that includes and should center both indigenous and black women. And uh, often when we are talking about women being in places of power or women being given opportunities, it's often white women that, that we're talking about. So I think it's very Great. important to the crucial question that was asked. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Samia. We are at 2 p.m., so I'd like to thank all presenters. I know we have a number of questions still coming in, and we will go back and make sure that you get some responses there. I'd like to thank all of you for joining today's uh, conversation. It was definitely lots of information shared, and I really appreciate Abe, Samia, and Anjan for joining us on the call today. I want to leave us with this quote. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues from this one of my favorites. I think what we're hearing uh, a lot of the speakers speak to is this sense that another world is not only possible, but I think in many ways we're already living in another world. And our challenge as we go forward is thinking about how do we continue some of these gains which we're now seeing. And Jim talked about 20 days versus 20 years. So what are the opportunities for us to continue this in our work? And I think Abe uh, had a very concrete call there to us to speak to our council members, to speak to police services. I think those are really concrete ways to help us all move forward in our work. I also noticed a number of participants share uh, some really uh, some good opportunities for action, which again will be making available to 